Good morning, Franciscans, and welcome to St. Francis Church. This is the se uh, second Sunday after Pentecost, and it's also Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. And it's also Juneteenth Day, so happy Juneteenth for those of you who have recently or long found out about this holiday. Um, I want to let you know some things that are going on in the life of the parish. We have a, a, a really wonderful old friend named Bill Meyer who died this past year. Um, Bill's memorial service, which has been delayed, will now be held on July 12th, which is a Tuesday at 11 a.m. at St. John's Church in McLean. Uh, Bill was the rector of that church, and in his time as on staff at that church, he helped to found St. Francis. I know he has many friends, um, so they are going to honor Bill on that day. I also want to let you know that we have a Habitat for Humanity build coming up. Uh, Habitat for Humanity during COVID has uh, been limited in its building, and they're looking for volunteers for three days um, that we can sign up for. Wednesday, July 27th, Friday, August 12th, and September 28th. So those of you who are handy with a hammer or paintbrushes or anything else, um, that's a really wonderful way to get yourself involved. Uh, if you have any questions about that, Phil Pfeiffer, who is uh, on our outreach committee, a member of this parish, uh, has his um, email listed in this announcement sheet, and you can contact Phil to ask about what you need to do. I know the people of Habitat are always gracious in welcoming people who wish to work. Um, I also want to let you know that today we're going to be wrapping up in the rector's uh, Bible study, Ezra Nehemiah, and we're going to take a break for the rest of the summer and we'll reconvene in September either with some sort of study around the Bible or the Bible itself. So I am grateful for the crowd who has been walking through this wonderful book with me and we've learned so much together. I, am, uh, I cannot wait. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand and we'll sing our opening hymn, number 658. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, 
and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from Isaiah. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord, because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In us far away, O oh Lord, you are my strength, hasten to help me, save me from the sword, my life from the power of the Lord, save me from the lion's mouth, my 
reading from the letter to the Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our sequence here today is 679. 679. <laughs> Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on the land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes and did not live in a house for in, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man whom the demons had gone, from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. 
Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is an interesting combination of days. We have Father's Day. Thank you, fathers, for being part of, of life and forming families and, and, and being there to give a model of behavior for children, for friends. We probably should honor both sexes and all genders at some point in time in all things, but specifically our country has chosen to honor mothers and fathers on some days in spring, and God bless them. And that sense of being in family is an important thing about today's readings, because today's readings are about being inside and outside of things. So when you're in a family, you know you're in a family, right? I mean, even if the family is a a really thrown together thing, um, not all families, not even in the Bible are mom and dad and two children, 2.5 children or whatever the statistical norm is. Some of those families are like the family of, of Lazarus, where it's Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And there's, you know, all sorts of unspoken comments about whether there had been husbands or wives or any of these other things. It doesn't appear there are any children either. So the Bible, you know, works on us around this insider-outsider thing. And one of the things Jesus was trying to do in his life was to begin to get people to understand family can be insider-outsider based on things other than bloodlines. And this theme of Jesus is picked up by Paul. So we have this letter today, Galatians from Paul. And in it, Paul says, In baptism, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is, nor is there male and female. It almost sounds like it was a ritualistic, formulaic sense of what baptism was about. We don't use it in our current baptismal rite, but it's a sense of beginning to talk to a community that was probably mostly Gentiles about this thing of faith and insider-outsider family behavior that Paul was recognizing. Now, the truth of the matter, Paul is reconditioning this because he was angry. So I'm going to go back and in the letter of Galatians to the beginning of chapter 3. And this is what Paul says to the congregation that he helped found. You foolish Galatians. (laughs) Pretty nice. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly executed and crucified. The only thing I want you to learn from to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing works of the law or by believing what you heard? See, this is what Paul is talking about. Paul was a Jew. He was raised a Jew. He was probably even trained in Jerusalem by a rabbi named Gamaliel at some point in time. And he was very, very zealous for his Judaism. But something happened to Paul and he began to recognize, well, gee... Jesus and God are not just for the Jews, therefore, oh, everyone, Gentile or Jew, male and female, slave or free. And in exhibiting this, they had a thing going on in the Christian communities, which was called 
the Eucharistic table. Now, that's not the name it was called of by then. When they were banqueting together and feasting together, they were probably actually having dinner and not styrofoam wafers. Sorry, guys, I couldn't let that go. But it was real food and a real feast, and it was blessed by the leader of the community, and Jesus was really present, and they thought it was important for people to know that. Now, we still wrestle with this insider-outsider theme. And I have a couple of senses today, one historical and one going on in the church right now that I think will sort of highlight what I'm talking about. Today is Juneteenth. For those of you who have only recently learned about Juneteenth, it was a day that was recognized, believe it or not, on the uh, secular calendar in Texas, oh, for a long time. I remember that when I was first starting in banking, I was living in Texas. I lived there for three years, and that's when I found out about Juneteenth. Now, being a good Virginian, born and reared in the Commonwealth, I didn't know anything about Juneteenth. We had enough holidays in Virginia. You know, there was Robert E. Lee's birthday. Oh, yeah, and enough icons to go around from George Washington to Thomas Jefferson to James Madison and James Monroe. And I say that both as somebody who revered all of that history growing up and as an adult has come to understand that it, it all isn't perfect. When I first found out about Juneteenth, I had some colleagues, all of whom were white, um, who told me that there was going to be a big celebration on, on June 19th, primarily in the African-American community of the state of Texas. And not knowing that particular part of the history, I said, what's this all about? And they told me. On June 19th in 1865, something like this would be two months after the uh, April 16th surrender of, of the Confederates, actually, it was probably a week before, but long about there in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, which occurred, that the military representative for the uh, occupying forces in Texas read the Emancipation Proclamation out in Galveston, Texas. Therefore, the Emancipation Proclamation was now proclaimed to some of the westernmost parts of the slave-holding territories. These are the last slaves who found out about it, and they were released from bondage as a result. And this was a time for celebration. It was time for us to acknowledge it's just one date. And by the way, there was a lot of work left to do, and there's still a lot of work left to do in bringing us all together, recognizing that the African-American community was a full and constituent part of the United States of America. And it is a weird, but I think in many ways, an interesting holiday, which reminds us of our humanity and flawed nature, because, gosh, it took till 1865 for us to do this, and yet also hold out hope that we can continue to grow in faith and love and in inclusion. And not inclusion like, why don't don't we just include you? But I mean really fully embracing people to be part of our community. So I think it's auspicious that on this day we're doing that as we prepare. As Episcopalians for a general convention which will convene in Baltimore, Maryland this summer. And in that convention we have a resolution out there that I think is confused about insider outsiderism but it does hold it up and that resolution is proposed by the diocese of northern california to allow communion of the unbaptized as the standard for the whole episcopal church sounds really cool doesn't it i think it's still confused so if i were a delegate i would tell you i'm not i wouldn't vote for it although i was one who at one time practiced it and was in a congregation, my sending congregation from St. Bartholomew's in New York City, where it was done in front of the bishop and everybody. So just to let you know, to do this is non-canonical, and it does subject that priest to disciplinary action. 
though nobody's getting prosecuted for it. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Not even the folks in Northern California. Bill Tully was my sponsoring priest. Bill Tully was once the rector of St. Columbus in Washington, D.C., went up to New York and was going to teach us all about a lot of things, and he did. And one of the things he challenged us with was the communion of the unbaptized because, as he would say, after every um, first half of, of our worship service, the part called the Liturgy of the Word, he would go. So, this morning, if you feel called to God's table, we invite you to receive. Because this is God's table and not ours. There are rules. We'll talk about them afterwards. Now, the thing that was interesting about Bill, Bill Tully's invitation was he understood there's a connection between baptism and communion. He once told me that he figured very few people would take him up on this, number one, and number two, because we were living in New York City, a polyglot city of, of races and creeds and everything else mixed up. He said, I don't want an obstacle to be in front of somebody to come to Jesus. Yep, come to Jesus. So he connected the two. And by the way, when we look back in the ancient texts, it sometimes seems that, yes, people were commune before baptism, but it was always connected to baptism. Now, my biggest complaint about the people who want to put this forward is that they make no connection in the resolution to baptism and communion. It's this insider-outsider thing. And it is a holy thing, and I really would love to be in a place where by that we extend an invitation, but I also know that baptism in and of itself is an invitation. Just in case you're curious, go, back, go turn to page 299 in the Book of Common Prayer. You could even do it now if you wanted to, and you can look through it. People are invited to be present with God through the water and the Holy Spirit. It's our invitation sign to be handed out to people to say come on in and by expressing your faith through Jesus you are part of God's kingdom I see people are even taking me up way to go it's it's really good now there is insider outsiderism even in the church but let me give you some sense of the vision that I hold that I think was also true for Paul there's a membrane around the church but it's a permeable membrane. It should be easy to enter. And if you really don't want to be part of us, reasonably easy to, to leave. Although I certainly hope you don't want to. Paul is here talking about how it's important to be in this community, to be part of a family. And the only thing you need to identify yourself with this is your love for Jesus Christ. Baptism, by the way, after we mark you with the sign of the cross, we do that with all our baptismal candidates, is invisible except for how you live your life. There's no circumcision to find. There are no food laws that we absolutely require. All those were part of being Jewish. And... Paul recognized the importance of those marks of Judaism as well. He wasn't trying to simply eliminate them. He was trying to express the fullness of God's love by knowing that there's a whole group of nations out there who never were part of the Jewish community who are now being bound to God in love and faith through baptism, not through having to go in a retrograde fashion to adopting the Jewish customs. By the way, God bless Jews who follow Jesus, who continue to follow their custom. God bless Jews who are still Jewish and follow their customs. And God bless Jews who aren't really sure about whether or not this makes sense anymore or not. So know this, that if you're in the Episcopal Church, really the mark of inclusion starts with baptism. And if you're not baptized, talk to me. We'll get this done. We have an altar call every week. It is communion. That was the other reason Bill thought communion should be open. In case of 
you, you don't know. Altar calls are what people used to do in evangelical churches all the time to give your life to Jesus. And if you're a Methodist and an Arminian Methodist, you had to do that a lot. If you're a Baptist, you only had to do it once. Well, if you'd already been baptized as an infant, it was especially important that you do it and get rebaptized. But we'll talk about those differences of noting community some other time. I love Paul. Paul lived in the messiness of human existence, and he writes about it all the time. Here's what I would tell you. God's goal would be to get everybody in that membrane. That the whole world would be devoted to love through Jesus. God isn't working to impose it. He's working to invite it. God works through wooing more than crushing. Yeah, we can talk about the difference between the Old and New Testament. I get it. I will, I will let you know there are a lot of invitations and wooing in the Old Testament too. This is the way of God and this is the way of life. One final comment. When Jesus found the Gerizim demoniac, rather than running him out of town, he invited him into relationship. And in the whole Gospel of Luke, he's the only verified Gentile disciple that we know of. He sat at the feast of Jesus in his right mind and then went on to proclaim what he had done for him to all around. That's really our job, to sit at the foot of Jesus, to sit in relationship with each other, and to proclaim the love of Christ so the world can see it. Just like Jesus pierced the geography boundaries of the Gerizines, we're asked to pierce that boundary between ourselves and the world around us all the time. Bringing the boundary with us so people can come in, not be thrown out. I understand the instincts of our own Northern California diocese. They want people to hear the love of God, and I commend them for it. And we will still continue to practice the ancient ways here. But no, the invitation stands. Our membrane is permeable, and I invite you to come on in. The Nicene Creed is found on page 358, and standing, let us affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. 
For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, for the Diocese of Virginia, the North Fairfax region of the Diocese of Virginia, the Diocese of Ezo, and St. Francis Church, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, Presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church, Susan and Jennifer, Bishops of the Diocese of Virginia, Mark, Bishop-elect of the, the Diocese of Virginia, Isaac, Bishop of the Diocese of Ezo, for John, retired Bishop of the Diocese of Ezo, Tracy, priest, Timothy, candidate for holy orders, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> for Congress, the President, and his administration, the justices and judges of the federal courts, the Virginia legislature, the governor of Virginia and his administration, the judges of the Commonwealth courts, the presidents of Ukraine and Russia, the leaders of the nations and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the Juneteenth Proclamation of Liberty to Enslaved Peoples of the United States, that remembering this declaration, we may address our rebellious natures, which drive us to control other people, and yet remain a people of hope in living the freedom of godly love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our nation's annual remembrance of fathers, for their living out of the fruit of the Spirit in the formation of families, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Great Falls, McLean, Reston, Vienna, Fairfax County, and Loudoun County, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to use it wisely, and in accordance with his purposes and to his glory, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, for business, pleasure, relaxation, family connection, and returning home, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, Carolyn, Dominic, Pauline, Carla and Rick, Mark and Jackie, Charlie, Ely, Maria and Jeff, Rick, Dave, Kara, Rick, Driss, Bob, Bryson, Kim, Martha, Samantha, Kathy and Steve, Henri and Alice, Desiree and Laura. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those for whom our prayers have been answered, George, Diana, Catherine and Dutt, we give thanks for the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the completion of the studies by the high school and college students from the St. Francis community and the beginning of the next phase of their lives, Eric and Ian Bellino, that their work and relationships may be filled with God's abundance, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, especially for the people of Ukraine, Russia, Hong Kong, Tibet, China, and for the Uyghurs, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in your compassion protect us, O Lord, by your grace. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of blessed Francis of Assisi and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. O God, who hast made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and did send thy blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near, 
Grant that people everywhere may may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor as we devoutly need it. Okay, everybody I think has greeted all the people they need to greet. Um, It's great to see you. We don't have a second announcement here right now. I'm just going to let you know we will have communion. The way we're working it right now is the ushers will uh, direct you when to come forward. When you come forward, I'll be standing in the middle there, and we're going to receive standing up. So come forward, and I'll um, put blessed bread and uh, offer you the wine the wine will be on the right-hand side, unless I can, no, you're, are, are you able to do wine this morning or are you singing? Yeah. So we've got two wine stations. Um, they'll be here and on the other side. When you take in communion, you go to the uh, cup. You don't have to take the cup, um, but if you want to take the cup, please drink. Don't intinct. Um, it works well that way. And... Um, And if you're not going to receive, you can just walk on by um, and go back to your seat. Know that if you've received in the bread or the wine, you've received both. So that's the way it works in the church. And, um, oh, and if you are a gluten-free person, put your right hand on top of your left hand. We have gluten-free wafers for those of you who knew gluten-free. And we will communion, commune you from the table. So thank you very much. And now as the... Choir offers an anthem. Um, We will uh, set the table and prepare to receive you. And with that, I invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Our service continues with the great thanksgiving for Eucharistic Prayer B. I invite the congregation to stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. For the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with blessed Francis of Assisi and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
The post-communion prayer begins on page 366. I invite you to stand. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Our final hymn is 388, verses 1, 2, and 3.